Right. Any other questions before I go back to Mr. Dar? Yes, that's right here. The woman here with the hat. Yes, with the hat. Um, I was just wondering how how do you find the difference between just like an ancient um, ancient stone tool and a regular ancient stone. Uh, right. That's a, that, I've often wondered, that's a good question. So, so Mark showed some pictures of what he called tools and they look like pebbles. And so the question is, how does an archeologist like you tell the difference between a stone that's a tool and a stone that's a stone? That's, we, just, we just make it up. No. Um, I don't know whether you can actually, there are we. Um, Yeah. 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 Okay, how could we do this? Um, there are basically a series of, of criteria that can be used that, unfortunately, these are very sort of grainy specimens, but the, the, the nice ones that we get, uh, something like flint or obsidian, where it's very fine grain material, uh, you can see very clearly on um, something that is a, a, a flake that's been removed from a, a nodule like this has a series of characteristics including battering where it was hit at the top okay? and they then have a very distinctive outline that, so they, they they're typically flat on one side and then they have a bulb that comes down okay? and on that bulb you can see lines that sort of run around it and they often have a little scar on them. And basically that bulb of, of it's called a bulb of percussion. Okay? And basically what, what that is, it's, you know, when you're hitting the object, you're, you're putting a force wave through it. Okay? Much like when you throw a, a rock into a pond, you, know, you get this ripple effect. And so what we're seeing with, with this bulb and, and with these lines that run around it is that ripple effect, essentially. It, it's kind of difficult to get your head around because it's a solid object. But it, you know, it's basically when, when you hit it, when you hit it sufficiently hard, it reforms. And so you're left with these telltale signs of, of human or, or hominin action. It's difficult. It depends on the, on the, the, um, the quality of the material. So um, this stuff is pretty crappy. Um, <laughs> but you can still see there's, you know, there's this facet here. Okay. And if you were to look at that, um, close up, uh, you, you, you'd not only be able to, able to see an indentation, you'd probably be able to feel it as well. And that, that would be the sort of reverse, so you've got the bulb on the flake, and, okay, and that's coming off a, a nodule, so the nodule has an indentation. Does that make sense? It's kind of difficult to explain without actually having a better diagram. Um, yeah, so there are basically a series of criteria that you can... You know, in some cases, if the material is pretty poor, it, it can be very difficult. Um, but in, 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 in most cases, it's pretty clear. Okay. So I think we'll take the... Greg, do you want to have the last question? Or? Yes, well, I just wanted to point out, we were talking about evolution by natural <coughs> selection before, that there's natural selection, ecological selection, and sexual selection as well. And Darwin had quite a bit to say about sexual selection in humans. And so uh, there's some good evidence that there is some strong selection that has gone on so the point is that when we talk about evolution, we talk about just simply changes, we talk about natural selection, we talk about changes that are adaptations, and, but there's one special form of adaptation which is adapting to, your other, to the other sex, and that's called sexual selection, and there's lots of evidence in the human lineage for that, and in two weeks we will have a talk right here called Darwin and Your Sex Life, which we will be exploring sexual selection. Did you want to make a comment on sexual selection in the hominid lineage? Um, uh, yes, I can. Um, <laughs> one of the interesting things about the, the hominins that we're, we're still, uh, I think, sort of trying to um, understand is, is sexual dimorphism. So we see with some of these... Where are we? Um, some of these species, the, the males are, are dramatically larger than the females. So dimorphism basically means you've got two different morphologies. And then, you know, for example, uh, Pranthus boisei there, you've got males at about you know, 49, 50 kilograms and, and females at about 34 kilograms. So males are, are, are much bigger than females. And um, you know, th this probably relates to, if we, if we look at what's going on in extant primates, these sort of differences relate to breeding systems. 
Okay? And in particular, what they seem to relate to is the amount of male-male competition. So in something like Pranthropus boisei, um, it's, it seems probable, based on if we look at uh, gorillas and, and, and orangutans, for example, that we've got intense male competition going on. And the, the argument here is basically where you see um, you know, body size is, is a really important factor in, in, uh, in, in conflicts. Okay? It can lead to uh, you know, success in conflicts. So there's selection for increased body size. So where we've got uh, breeding systems where one male dominates a number of females, okay, there tends to be intense competition between the males for access to those females. And, and so we might infer from that that, that Boise Eye had either a, a harem structure like we see in gorillas. So gorillas have a social system where there's the one big silverback male who basically dominates the, the, uh, the reproductive output of several females. Okay. And then there are other males out there who would really like to get in and you know, take over that harem. So there's, there's intense competition there. Or with um, orangutans, uh, they, they have a slightly different system where the females are, are basically uh, solitary, at least that they, that it's just the females and their, their offspring, and then one big male basically patrols the territories of a series of females. Okay, and then there are, you know, other, there's intense competition amongst the males for access to those territories. So we might be looking with Boise Eye there at some sort of social structure that's similar to that. Um, you know, with humans, it's a much reduced... Uh, sexual dimorphism, so we have a moderate level of sexual dimorphism, um, similar, in fact, to, to what we see in, in chimpanzees. Okay. So at, at some point in human evolution, it looks uh, probably about the time that we see the appearance of Homo agaster, Homo erectus, these, these first early humans, that there's a transition from a situation where we've got intense male-male competition to one where uh, you know, the, the, the breeding systems are probably more like what we see in, in humans or, or what we see in chimpanzees. So there's certainly changes, it seems, on the basis of these sexual dimorphism uh, data, there are changes in, in, in sexual selection in the course of human evolution. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been, it's been a, a long and information-rich evening. Um, thank you all. Uh, I think we should, well, obviously we're going to thank uh, Dr. Collard again. I remind you, next week is Darwin and your brain, if I'm not mistaken. And then, is that right? Yes. And then Darwin and your sex life. So with that, please join me in thanking Dr. Collard. <laughs>